This is Infants on Thrones. Listener Essay. Listener Essay. Listener Essay. Welcome back to Infants on Thrones. I'm Glenn Ostland, and this is our November 2018 Listener Essay Contest. <laughs> where you, the listeners, get to say what you want to say, how you want to say it, where you want to say it, and it is more than a privilege that that where gets to be here, that we get to host these on Infants on Thrones, where so many of us are all infants sitting on different kinds of thrones, right? Today's essay comes from Sarah and is titled Monogamy. And after you listen, please go to our website and vote for it and provide the author some personal feedback Winners will be announced in early December. First place gets $200, second place $100, and third place $50. All right, ready, set. All right, go ahead. Monogamy. Even just saying the word provokes a visible reaction on my boyfriend's face. He looks like he does when he takes his first sip of whiskey before the ice has had time to cut it. After almost three years of being madly in love, buying a house together and sharing all aspects of our life, I have finally vocalised what it is that I want. After Mormonism crumbled for me, I quickly deconstructed Christianity and ended up a seven on the Dawkins scale of atheism. I realised that my husband was not going to adopt my new philosophies, choosing to find refuge in the floaty and ephemeral concept of spirituality and the rather more blunt conservatism that has such a grip on this country. Our marriage broke down fast, leaving me, a former stay-at-home mother with no college education, on the edge of a potential life of who the hell knows what. And then came S, at once charming, funny, educated, progressive, an atheist, irresistibly sexually attractive to me, and the whole world seemed to finally make sense. We embarked on a breathless affair of the heart. Passion was something I had not experienced in my marriage, and I knew it was the one thing I had always wanted and needed, but hadn't known I'd wanted and needed. We travelled together, we went out every night and socialised, I met his family and his friends, we surreptitiously had sex in his parents' bedroom, we had sex in the Joseph Smith Memorial Building in Salt Lake and in movie theatres, we stayed up until 3am talking and sharing and laughing and having more sex. And the sex. Oh, the sex. I had no idea it could be like that. S brought out things in me I had no idea I could do or feel. My body felt sexier and more alive at 35 than at any other time in my life. I took sexy selfies, and when I sent them to him, he responded as though he had thirsted for me his whole life. And so I moved in with him. And then he invited his male friend to join us in the bedroom. At first, I was caught up in how interested he was in this encounter. He assured me he had done this with previous girlfriends and it had been very successful and fulfilling, especially for his girlfriend. At first, it seemed a little exciting, but his friends seemed detached. I certainly didn't feel that much or that motivated, except when it was over. S seemed so happy and even more in love with me than before. Our sexual odyssey with one another became more intense. I thought of nothing but S, day and night. Within the fire that burned in me, I felt I knew that S only thought about me too. Sex at dawn, the ethical slut, opening up, the game, our souls finish first, and the list goes on. Amongst the books on politics, philosophy, religion, and a full range of classic novels were an extremely healthy amount of books in my boyfriend's library about being non-monogamous. A full range of anti-exclusivity literature, you could say. I was taken aback by some of the things S had highlighted and underlined in red in these books. When I asked him about it, he seemed sheepish and apologetic almost, yet finally admitting that he didn't believe in or want monogamy. It was like a sharp pain to the chest. The idea of my lover being with someone else, wanting someone else, pursuing someone else. Yet, hold on, I had deconstructed Mormonism, religion in general, God, conservatism, multiple MLMs, and a full range of previously held beliefs. I found a lot of joy in my newfound credos, so monogamy may very well have been another outdated philosophy that could be relegated to the memory hole. I reflected on how it felt to finally realise the church was not true, despite all the negative emotional stuff that went with having a family still completely in. I could literally feel my mind expanding, and it was amazing. 
Even my brief stint with night terrors, as my brain wrapped itself around the concept of ceasing to exist, did not discourage me, and I finally landed in a place from which I could never go back, and wouldn't want to. Maybe monogamy was another thing that just wasn't true. There were enough books in the library to study the topic intensively. Some books I read in a day while Es was on business trips. I felt armed and ready, even though a large amount of the material caused me to raise my sceptical eyebrow and seriously doubt what it was I was reading. But something needed to be done. An ex-girlfriend of Esses had approached me and warned me that in every respect he was the perfect boyfriend, yet when it came to sex he could not control himself. She also told me to check his texts, and in a moment of weakness, of which I'm not proud, I did, and discovered that he had been pursuing other women without telling me. My first real crack appeared in something that had not yet even become my new philosophy. If openness is open, why wouldn't he tell me about it? Despite our problems, which were beginning to show themselves, we embarked on the open relationship adventure. One encounter, a couple swap, I will always remember. We were at a hotel after a friend's wedding. The room had two beds. I was in one with our friend C, and S was in another with our friend L. C and L were S's friends from before we had ever met, and I initially felt some sense of safety with them. C couldn't get it up, however, and I tried all I could think of in my seduction playbook. And then I looked over at S and L. They were laying facing each other, arms and legs wrapped around one another, whispering and giggling in each other's ears, and my vision became blurry, almost blinding me temporarily. This was intimate, and it felt like betrayal. Completely naked and vulnerable, I told S I had had enough, and then spent the rest of the evening sobbing in his arms, while C and L probably thought I was unhinged. Subsequently, I learned that S had had sexual encounters with these friends before, but had neglected to tell me. I still didn't know what openness meant if it wasn't being honest with each other. We continued to discuss it. S tried to convince me that I didn't like it because of my social conditioning, and I wondered if that were true. It would definitely need more testing. After all, upon leaving the church, I initially felt awkward and worried about drinking alcohol, but now you could say I'm a professional drinker and proud of it. I felt like I could try more situations. We began attacking the social scene and I began to learn the language. Like the language of Mormonism spoken in prayer, the community has its quirks. Having sex with others is referred to as playing, something I've always secretly laughed at. Being English, I've never had an inner child, and messing with deep emotion has never felt like playing to me. And the crowd refers to itself as the lifestyle. One day, I began talking to a man over Facebook Messenger in the lifestyle who I'll call M, and who seemed very pleasant. He was undoubtedly awful at flirting and banter, but he was liberal, cerebral, and we had some good conversations. We eventually had dinner with him one evening, and straight after, he texted me and asked me on a date. Everything in me revolted at the prospect. I said, no, S was my boyfriend. What would having sex with this guy do for me? I asked myself. Months later, when dealing with S's issues over my friendship with a couple of single guys not in the lifestyle scene, I asked him why he never seemed bothered by M's advances, especially since my two single friends had never proposed sex, whereas M definitely had. Well, it's about respect, my boyfriend replied. M texted me before he talked to you and asked me if it was okay if he approached you. Once again, a very large crack was appearing in my open relationship shelf. I thought I had left patriarchy behind a long time ago, and that it was a mere speck in my rearview mirror at this point. But what the fuck was this? Shouldn't it be up to me who I talk or don't talk to, or entertain for sex or not? S had not asked my permission before inviting a single woman to our house while I was in the UK visiting family and liquoring her up to propose a threesome with her and I. I don't mean to imply that I've been an angel throughout this journey and to accuse my boyfriend. I haven't continued to make a lot of mistakes. I've drunkenly made out with many people and even proposed something very awkward to S's brother while under the influence. I have sent way too many sexy selfies to people I shouldn't have particularly to men I never intended to meet and didn't want to have sex with, simply because it made me feel good and stroked my ego. And there have been funny moments that I wouldn't want to trade. One evening a close friend of ours, D, who is monogamously married, came over for a drink. S assumed that he was attracted to me over the year or so that we had hung out, and that night we ended up having a threesome. This was one of the best experiences I've had, as this is a friend that we made together, 
and there were no surprises. It was organic and fun. And then after, Dee stopped calling and texting us. After about a month, I got him to talk to me, and he intimated that he couldn't be friends with us anymore, as he had feelings for my boyfriend S, and didn't want to jeopardise his marriage over it. S was flawed. I was strangely attracted to the idea of exploring that for a hot minute. After all, most men seem to expect me to want to play with the same sex. But then reality set in. So I suppose I misspoke when I said I wouldn't trade the experience. It's another crack, if you will, in my budding open relationship testimony. While it was fun, it was not fun enough to lose a friend over. When S went out of town, Dee and I would sometimes get a beer at the pub if I felt lonely. And I miss that so much now. I don't make friends easily, and Dee is an incredibly interesting person. One thing I have admittedly enjoyed has been meeting new people. I love to people watch, and although not naturally gregarious, I have become more of an extroverted introvert over the years, and really love interesting people. There was that one couple. I found out that S was interested in the wife, and so I agreed to schmooze the husband to facilitate an encounter, as they liked to play together. He told me he was a cowboy. And what does that mean? I asked him. Is that what you do for a job? No, he replied, it's a way of life. Leaving me none the wiser, and just picturing him walking around town wearing a costume. Then as we continued the acquaintance, and I had to listen to some pretty horrendous country music, the wife posted an article on Facebook about homeschooled kids who weren't vaccinated being healthier than those that were. At that point, we both kind of just placed them in our nice but slightly crazy category and decided that sex was probably not going to happen. And then there was that guy who liked to record videos of his wife having sex with other men and then play them on a big screen at sex parties. He is one person at whom I tried not to look with a feeling of moral superiority at, but who appeared to me, together with his wife, as some sort of grotesque parody of what a respectful, open relationship should look like. If there is any fun in it for me, it's these interesting people. Another male friend I met during the last few years who lives in Washington calls himself a single polyamorist. He has four different women who all have sex with him on a regular basis. They each get one weekend a month with him, plus time during the week. One time we were chatting and he said, I might be a little distracted as I have my baby girl over for the weekend. I asked him if he was referring to his daughter and he replied that he was actually talking about his 24 year old lover. He is 45 years old. I wondered what beyond sex was really between them and tried and immediately failed to not judge him. He has made no secret of the fact that he would like me to join in the shenanigans at any time, should I wish to. Is this just a new version of polygamy? One thing is for certain, I balk at this in much the same way I did when learning about Joseph Smith's extracurricular activities. It's been a journey for me. I discovered that any other man I felt strongly about was not likely to be in the lifestyle, but outside that culture, and someone I would meet in everyday life. There would be people with whom I didn't immediately want to play, but have conversations with and connect with on a deeper level first. But then I also learned that it would open me up to falling in love, and polyamory was the last thing I wanted to entertain, and I know they felt the same, as did S. It's almost been like a test of endurance, a marathon if you will, that I've challenged myself to out of love for S. I feel like I made it to mile marker 25 and simply found myself unable to continue. My knees have officially given out. I have failed to find the fun. So here I am, having gone full circle. I have let go of so many things in the last five years, but monogamy is proving a tough one. S certainly may decide he can't deal with that reality, and we may go our separate ways, but I'm built to follow where my internal compass directs me. Despite what I lost when I left the church, I wouldn't take the decision back. I do sometimes wish I could refer to some authority to tell me what to do once in a while. The Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster, to which I loosely subscribe, doesn't really seem equal to the task. Hey, that was great. All right, listeners, don't forget to go to our website and vote for this essay. Provide some feedback. And if you've got something you want to say and you can squeeze it in before the end of November, record your own listener essay. Send it to us. We'll post it. Come support us on Patreon. And as always, thanks for listening to Infants on Thrones. Hi. This is Hillary, Matthew, Ryan, Carol, Dashley, and I like to play bingo online while listening to Infants on Thrones. You can comment on this episode on the website, infantsonthrones.com. If you really like what you hear, 
give the quorum a five star rating and write a short review on iTunes. I did. I did. I did. Anyone for the closing prayer? Thank you for listening to Infants on Thrones. Infants on Thrones.